Cameron's A and B Mark. Tell me a little bit about your upbringing and what your family was like. I had the most amazing childhood, and I, I think mostly it was because I had really motivational absolutely can do anything kind of parents. My dad was a military officer and um, my mom was a school teacher and then became a guidance director. And they always raised me that I could do anything if I put my mind to it. Um, and there was also no difference when I was raised between my brother and me. So no allowances were given to him that weren't given to me. And at a certain age I was allowed to come in at midnight also and that kind of thing. And, and we learned to drive a car and learned to do the stick shift and all those kinds of things were very equal in our household. Why, why do you think they were so enlightened? I mean, we, we grew up in the same era, right? We were up in the 50s. Not all families were like that. Well, you know, I wouldn't say my parents were so enlightened in every way because my father, in many respects, was an extremely conservative guy. But I think there was also a hidden agenda here where my mother was so discriminated against in her childhood and, and the, the brother was favored. So he got the college education and she had to get scholarships. So it was really important, they felt, to give us both opportunities and the girl as well as the boy. It was really funny later in my life when I began competing in sports and um, I would always try to compete against my brother, whether it was tag or climbing trees or whatever, and he was always ahead of me because he was three years older. But I never thought it was because he was a guy. I thought it was because he was older than I was. That's an important mentality, I think, to have for a little girl. Did you identify with one parent or the other more? I think all children identify with one parent more than the other, at least at the beginning. Um, you know, I just adored my father, and, and who couldn't adore him? He was 6'5", he was gorgeous, he looked like Clark Gable, and he was always motivating. You can do it, kid, come on, you can do it. Whereas my mother, you know, little girls want to please their fathers, I think. And uh, it wasn't until I was about 35 did I realize that my mother was just unbelievable and provided an example for me that was subtle um, but very impactive. And that example was what? My mother uh, not only got herself through college and worked the whole way and got scholarships, but then she became an educator um, after she raised us kids. So she entered the workforce late and just went right to the top as one of the top educators in the country, um, became a top guidance director, helped create the whole um, aspect of guidance directing, and, um, and could balance everything. I mean, she incredible Christmases, incredible cooking, and getting up at five in the morning. And um, I, I, off, I think one reason why I didn't have kids is I thought I could never do it as well as she could do it. She was the original super mom, and I didn't realize that until much later in my life because she never laid that on me. She just let it happen, and I think it was the greatest kind of love. Did you feel that one of them or the other had more power in the family? Or? You know, it's interesting about power in the family. I, I always think that um, there is a dynamic in a relationship uh, but, but now that I've been married for 25 years, I, I realize that sometimes there's a waxing and waning. My father, I think, being a dominant male and very, very masculine guy was the dominant figure, but I think my mother was really the power behind the throne, if you see what I mean. I think my father really knew he wouldn't have been as successful as he was if he didn't have my mother as a partner. How did your parents see gender roles? I mean, did they express it, and, and what did they think about your I was always told, you've got to earn a living and to be a professional person and to be able to pay your own way. You can never rely on anybody else to do that for you. You can think of nothing else but to get a college education and we're going to pay for that college education because we had to work our own way through college in the depression and I heard all these depression stories. So these things were laid out, you will do this. You know, I didn't, it was like, don't even think about anything else. Um, and it was also like, we're giving you opportunities that we didn't have. I, I suppose there was plenty of guilt there, but it was, uh, you didn't have to be a pea brain as a kid to understand that your parents did go through a very tough time. You've got a gift here, and um, you really have a responsibility for doing your best. I think I grew up with an incredible sense of responsibility. We know what you wound up doing, but I'm just wondering, what did you want to be when you grew up? What did I want to be when I grew up? Well, it's really funny, you know, you, 
I think kids cast about for, for things. I, I, believe it or not, I really love flowers. You know, I can't see very well, can't hear very well, but I can really smell things, and I just love flowers. And I was very, very good at helping my dad with the gardening, and, um, and I s loved biology in high school, and I, I thought, you know, I'd like to be a, a horticulturist. That's what I'd really like to do. And, but boy, did I love to move. I mean, I love to, to run and to play hard. But I also love very feminine things. Uh, it was really funny. I mean, I would go out and play war and build forts and climb trees and jump off the roof like, like all the boys in the neighborhood. But I would always come in and want to put on my party dress and play with my dolls. And I didn't see any uh, difference in this. But as, as for growing up, I was not interested in being a teacher. I was not particularly interested in being like a mother. Um, but I really wanted a profession. And to me, it was, it was something that grew. And I think that, that that's a very interesting choice for a young kid to, to help produce something that's going to grow. Flowers. I think I wasn't a particularly good student. I was incredibly hardworking. But in my own defense, I have to say, my parents started me in school in an experimental educational program at age five. So we were all age five in this start-up school, this program. But as I grew up and we moved because we were in the Army, suddenly I was two years later with kids who in the next class were a year or even two years older than I was. And then that happened all the way through the rest of my education. I was always the youngest one and I was always behind because sometimes a kid's brain doesn't develop, you know, to, to you know, uh, embrace concepts. And so I had a difficult time, but I mean, I, I made B's, um, but I wasn't an A student, that's for sure. And I really, really had to work hard. When did you get a sense of yourself as being athletic? There's a funny story about being, getting the sense of yourself being athletic. M my story kind of began with um, me seeing in high school, and I was in high school, and I, you know, I was only 12 years old. And I was seeing the really popular pretty girls were cheerleaders. And I thought, oh, well, that's the passport to being popular and to being attractive and, you know, being grown up. And so I came home one day and I told my father I was going to be a cheerleader. And I was practicing the things. And he said, no, 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 you don't want to be a cheerleader, honey. And I said, what? And he said, cheerleaders are cheering on the sidelines for other people. You want to be in the game. He said, life is to participate, not to spectate. And I mean, what a thing to tell your little girl. And I thought, well, he's right. He said, you really want to play. You can run. You ought to get out there. And your school has something called field hockey. And you could play on that field hockey team. And I said, oh, I can't, Dad. I can't do that. And he said, why not? He said, yeah, I know you've never played it before, but it's a matter of conditioning. And if you get out and run a mile every day, you'd make that field hockey team. And that was actually the turning point in my life. I wasn't to know that then, of course, but I started running this mile a day. And he was really amazing. We, had a, we lived on a like seven-eighths of an acre plot, and we measured off the sides of it, and seven laps equaled a mile. And he helped me do that measuring. And then I went out and I ran seven laps, and I read it every single day. You know, I, I told you that I really work hard. I'm not particularly bright, but I've got a great work ethic. And I would do this dutifully every day. And we were living in northern Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. And in the summer, it's like living in a swamp. It is so hot. And I still did this, this mile run every day. And by the time the hockey season came in the fall, I was really one of the best players because I was in such great condition. But the amazing thing that happened was the transformational experience from this mile. There was this little girl who was out determined to do this mile every day. And every day I did it, I had this enormous sense of accomplishment. And really, that was like a victory under my belt every day that nobody could take away from me. And it translated into everything else I did. I said, well, if I can run a mile a day, I can do this. Or I can try out for the poetry club. Or I can work on the, the dance committee or whatever. It gave me a lot of confidence, courage, um, and belief in myself. And as I say, that's the thing that changed my life. I'm wondering, did you ever have a sense that it was maybe not a good thing to be a girl? Or did that ever occur to you? I always loved being a girl. I loved being feminine and I loved dressing up and I loved being strong and tough. I loved the surprise of the, the duality and it always caught people off guard. And of course, much later in life when, when I was asked to be a speaker at something because I was one of the first marathon runners, they, they always, it was great to watch the audience because they're usually guys, they're expecting a behemoth to arrive, you know, and they were always surprised that you were actually feminine. So I, I enjoyed that, um, that duality for a long time. But no, I, I always liked being a girl. Um, and I'll tell you something else. The reason I think I really liked being a girl 
was, was two things. One, I love the physicality of it. You know, I love the, the, the monthly change that my body would go through. I felt like I was part of nature very, very much that, that way. Um, and I loved also the fact that um, I felt so strong physically that it translated to my mental strength. And that made me very unintimidated around boys and men. And I was always accepted by them because I was not defensive or um, afraid of them. Did you have any? Childhood anxieties? I mean, what'd you, what'd everybody has them. What did you worry about when you were a kid? Oh, I worried about plenty when I was a kid. You know, I don't think you grow up um, with a dad who's away in the Korean War and hearing stories of the Depression and going through the Cold War and, and uh, living right outside of Washington, D.C. with all the missiles pointed at you and growing up with this, you know, drummed in, you know, that the communists can take you over at any time. Uh, without those fears, I was afraid for my family. I was afraid for um, uh, losing freedom. I was afraid for things that were beyond my control. And that's another reason why I think that running was very important to me, because at least I could control that, and I felt powerful uh, in myself. And in fact, I think you, know, you look at your childhood fantasies, and a lot of my childhood fantasies on the run were of being able to escape things and um, being able to survive things. Did you ever worry about how you appeared to the opposite sex? I never really worried about how I appeared to the opposite sex because I always thought I looked pretty good. <laughs> it's really amazing. I mean, but I worked at that. It's true. I, um, in my races and things, I, I always try to uh, not look like the Russian shot putter and, and to, to look feminine to, and to debunk the old myth of, of sports equals masculinity. Um, yeah, and like a little girl, I was always terribly worried about my appearance. Too much so. I mean, I can remember my father saying, no lipstick, you're too young for lipstick, and all that. Oh, Dad, everybody wears lipstick. And, um, you know, and I, I look back on that, and I think if I had a little girl, and she was 12 or 13, and she wanted to wear a lipstick, I'd drive me crazy, too. But that's, that's the way girls are. And, um, yeah, I, I, I had no problem with that. I remember very distinctly the 1960 Olympics, and I remember seeing Wilma Rudolph beautiful flowing across the, in winning the 100 meters. And, and, and then, this is in Life magazine, the big pictorial magazine, which doesn't exist now, but it was an amazing magazine. And that would be on one page, and the other page was uh, Tamara Press, the shot putter. Uh, and she was just really huge and had uh, dirty bra straps showing and, and a crew cut haircut and, and kind of ripply, you know, you know, hams for arms. And, and I thought, oh, is that, is that what it means to be a female athlete? And that's what scared me. But I kept looking at the two pictures and I decided, no, I could look like Wilma Rudolph <laughs> in my dreams. <laughs> but, but it's true. Um, I decided that you had to work at that image. And um, being a marathon runner, it isn't particularly easy because a marathon is a particularly grueling, sweaty, hard experience. But, um, you know, I think I did pretty well at it. And I think it was important. Now what's great, you know, at my age, at 64, I can look like anything I want to look like. It's really amazing. Do you ever remember other kinds of sexist treatment that you were subjected to as a kid? I don't remember sexist treatment per se, except... Um, people saying, I shouldn't be doing that. And, and I thought that they were silly. And here's an example. I'd be out running in the summer, and the milkman would come and knock on my, the door. My mother would come out, and she, he'd say, listen, I see your little girl out running. I mean, is everything OK? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, she, she's, she runs every day. That's what she does. And he said, are you sure she's OK? You know, because they thought I was some kind of deviant or running away or was hurt or something, because little girls didn't do that. Um, certainly running for a long time, People would, would try to run you off the road or would throw things at you. And believe it or not, women were worse than men at, at doing that to me. In school, the, the guys did not not want me to participate. But I wasn't chosen first to be on their team. But I was always the first girl chosen. So I always took that as a compliment. Um, and it was true. I could see that normally they were bigger and stronger and, and faster than I was, but I also knew that there were things I could do that they couldn't do. And I could always outlast them running. Why would people run you off the road? There are hoons out there all the time who are drinking and they throw the beer can at you or they throw an egg at you. They think it's really cute or, or they, they play chicken with you and come close and see if you're going to jump. And I always jump. You know, I'm not because people often are drunk or people lose control of their car, but they think it's really cute. Um, or some people are just angry, 
and uh, guys um, sometimes would run you off the road because they obviously sensed that there was a woman running and she was exemplifying power or she was doing something that they couldn't do. I didn't really psychoanalyze them. I just jumped, you know, and I didn't try to antagonize them back. Um, but the hurtful ones were when I was run off the road by women, and they would really come boring down on you, and it was... Um, I remember saying to my coach once, I said, why do they do that? And he said, oh, they're just jealous. And I said, what could they be jealous of? They could just go put on shoes and go out and run themselves. And he said, no, he said, you're doing something that they feel they can't do or feel that you shouldn't be doing, but they are just jealous of you having the freedom to do it. And um, it took a long time for me to, um, to get over that because I thought somehow women didn't get it. And then I realized... Um, within a few years, it wasn't that they didn't get it, it's that they didn't have the same opportunities that I had. And that's also a life-changing moment for me because I really thought I'm gonna change these the system so that I can create opportunities for them so they can experience the same sense of empowerment and joy that I have. And and many of the women um, that I, uh, I saw in my early years, in my 20s, let's say, who lived in the same apartment complex or whatever that I did, who used to tease me when I used to go out and run, um, became runners themselves and have written to me or made contact and said, you know, I'm so sorry I treated you so badly. Running has changed my life. And so I said, it's okay, you know, you know as long as you get it in the end. <laughs> yeah. Marathon had been going on for 70 years. Did you think you're a 19-year-old college student that you could run this race? When I went to college, I went to Lynchburg College in Lynchburg, Virginia for two years. It wasn't my first choice. I wanted a Big Ten university. My parents were paying for it, so I really had to, to go with their decision. And then my dad said that after two years, I could make my own choice. So at Lynchburg College, I played field hockey and lacrosse and basketball, but it was one spring in 66 that the track coach came out. He saw me running after, after um, hockey practice. Um, and said, hey, could I run a mile? And I said, of course I can run a mile. I can run three miles. And he said, well, we've lost some lettermen off our team, and I, I need somebody to help run the mile. We only have one miler this weekend. And if you could run the mile, um, you would get points. And I said, sure, coach. be glad to do it for you. Not thinking a thing about it. And so I go out there, and this is, creates a huge uproar in this small southern school. Everybody who never watched a track meet in their life came out to watch. Now, what were they watching for? Me to fail? Me to be able to do something superhuman or whatever? They thought running a mile was just like climbing Everest. Anyway, I ran the mile. I broke six minutes. I think I ran a 558. I got points for the team, but it made national news. It just went everywhere. And it, the, the exceptional thing was that a girl ran on a men's track team. And I just thought, well, great, I'm helping out the team. I was going to transfer schools anyway the next year, and I did. I wanted to go to Syracuse University because I wanted to study sports journalism. I had figured out that once I graduated from university, there was going to be no sports for me. There was, you know, there was no Olympics. Uh, there was, for women that, to speak of, except to sprinting, in sprinting. There was no um, uh, hockey or lacrosse things I was playing. And once I realized I graduated from college, I wasn't going to have a sport. So I'd really better sure run because that's something I could do by myself and stay in shape and have a real sense of empowerment, as I told you before. So, uh, but when I got to Syracuse, I was astonished at this huge powerhouse university having uh, really only intramurals for women. You know, the emphasis was, was on football, it was on lacrosse, it was on basketball and ice hockey for the guys, huge for the guys, nothing for the women. And that's when I first kind of got upset about sexism. And I thought, well, maybe the women themselves have chosen this. And if that's the case and the sports don't exist for women, maybe I can run on the men's cross country team. So I went out and talked to the, the cross country and track coach and he was kind of astonished. He said, I've been the coach here for 30 years and we've never had a, a woman be interested. And he said, I can't let you run officially on this team. He said, I heard about you running at Lynchburg. That was a different conference that was allowed. Here we're in the NCAA conference. Women can't compete on the men's team. But he said, I would welcome you and the team would welcome you if you came out to practice with us. I said, that's fine. That's all I really want. Uh, so I came out and began training with the men's cross country team. And again, here was an amazing moment in my life. You know, we're talking about the, the autumn of 1966. This is the, the eve of the women's liberation movement. Women are, are going and sitting in men's bars and demanding to be served. And, and, and I didn't quite understand that, although I certainly applauded 
you know, equal pay for, for equal work and that kind of stuff. But I thought these guys would think I'd be really in their face when I came out to, to run on the cross-country team. And instead, they were totally motivational and totally welcoming. And that is where I met the assistant coach, who wasn't really a coach. He was the university mailman. And his name was Arnie Briggs. And Arnie Briggs um, had been a really, really good runner. Uh, in fact, he still held the upstate New York record in the marathon. And he had been training with the men ever since he got back from World War II. And he had never seen, obviously, a girl come out before, and he was so excited. And said, we've never had a girl, we've never had a girl. And he really helped me and motivated me. And he had run the Boston Marathon 15 times. Now, to me, somebody who'd run the Boston Marathon 15 times and finished 10th, you know, in the top 10, I mean, that was like the Olympian gods. And he would tell me these stories of all these great legends in the sport. And I was absolutely electrified hearing them. I, you know, Clarence DeMar and Johnny Kelly the Elder and Johnny Kelly the Younger and Tarzan Brown and all these stories. And every day there would be another Boston Marathon story. And, you know, as the weeks went by, the stories would repeat themselves. It was kind of like a loop film. And pretty soon I got so I could tell the stories also. Then there was another pivotal night, which was in December, uh, right before a break and then during exams, uh, snow coming down, blizzard in Syracuse. And in, in case you don't know Syracuse, I mean, it's like caverns of snow. I mean, just canyons and, and mountains of snow. And it was freezing cold in a blizzard one night. And he said, oh, a woman can't run the Boston Marathon. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, the marathon distance is too long, 26 miles, 385 yards. And I said, what? We're running 10 miles in a blizzard. And you're telling me I can't run a marathon? He said, the big difference between 10 miles and 26. I said, I know that, Arnie. But when I met you, I could only run three miles. And he said, no woman can run the marathon. And I said, Arnie, you're really wrong. We started arguing. You know, I was a young kid, 19. I was crabby. And I, and I was just really irritated about being out there that night. And I, I said, you're wrong, Arnie. Other women have run marathons, including last year, Roberta Gibb ran the Boston Marathon. She jumped out of the bushes and she ran the race and he exploded. And he said, no dame ever ran no marathon. And I said, she did too. I read it in, the, in, in Sports Illustrated. And he said, no women ever ran a marathon. He wouldn't believe it. And then he got kind of reflective and he said, I'll tell you what, if any woman could do it, I've thought about this. You could do it, probably. But you're the only woman I could imagine. But you'd have to prove it to me. And you, if you, in fact, if you showed me in practice that you could do it, I'd be the first person to take you to Boston. So the grin came across my face and said, you know, hot damn, you know, I've got a coach, I've got a plan, I've got a goal, and I've got a dream. I mean, those are all the ingredients for success. And at that moment, again, another thing happened. I just began focusing. I said, okay, we're going to do this. At that time, what was considered an acceptable distance for a woman to run? You know, it's really amazing. The longest distance in the Olympic Games was in 1960 was the 800 meters, two laps around the track, a half mile. And this was reinstated into the Olympics with enormous controversy because in 1928, after a long battle that began at the turn of the century, women's track and field was allowed into the Olympic Games. And one of the events was the 800 meters. And the first three women, uh, the first set a world record, but the first three women finished in, um, I wouldn't say a distressed condition, but they were out of breath and kind of when lay on the infield and hands on their knees and things. And the Olympic officials were so upset at seeing women in, as I said, in a distressed condition, exhausted. Um, it was unseemly for this to occur in public. People were horrified. You know, this was not the, the image of women that we had in mind. And they struck that event from the Olympic Games until 1960. Did your own coach worry about this? My own coach did worry about this. In fact, the night of the, the blizzard, when he was obviously uh, you know, concerned and saying no woman could run a marathon, what I didn't know until sometime later is that when Arnie returned to the post office to, to, to clock out after to, with running with me in the afternoon, the guys at the post office are giving him a really hard time saying, hey, Arnie, you're going to ruin that girl. You know, she looks like a pretty nice girl, and you're out running, and, and you know, you better not go too far with that girl. You know, she, you're going to ruin her. Um, there was this, this sense that, that if you overdid, you were going to turn into a man or a behemoth or something. And so Arnie was really torn. You know, he had somebody he could run with in the snow. He had a friend, uh, he, and he somebody he could mentor um, and just hung on every word. 
and, um, and yet he was afraid of pushing me too far. And I, I just couldn't run far enough. Every night when I'd come in from a workout, I'd say, wow, five miles, what, 10 miles, 11, 15, fantastic. It was just a great, a great feeling. I always say a goal gives you a, f a tremendous focus. My goal began to show Arnie Briggs that I could run the 26 miles in practice. And so w without making a long story of this, we, it, we, we worked for many weeks and finally came the day we were going to do it. We started early in the morning because we figured it was going to take most of the day, which it did. Um, but we measured off several loop courses out into the country, out and back. And when we came in to 26 miles, 385 yards, Arnie said, I can't believe it, you look great and you're going to do it. You're, I'm so proud of you. And I, I thought that it would be like, you know, the Olympic medal was going to be waiting for me, and it was just so flat. And I said, Arnie, I feel really good. Maybe we mismeasured the course. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know what? We got, when we go to the Boston Marathon, which is my reward now, right, um, I've got to make sure we can, we can really cover the distance. We, we, maybe we mismeasured. Let's run another five miles. He said, you can run another five miles? I said, sure, I feel great, don't you? And he goes, uh, Sure, I guess, okay. So we went out another five miles. Now, a mile from our finish now, Arnie starts turning as gray as his sweatsuit. And he's all over the road, his eyes are gone. I said, oh man, he's out on his feet, you know? And I said, come on Arnie, come on, we can do this. Got a mile to go and put my arm through his. I said, come on, come on, come on, we can do it. A mile to go, a mile to go. And we, we finished in the parking lot where we had the car and I said, ah, we did it, we're going to Boston. And I threw my arms around him, we did it. And he passed out. <laughs> And I sat him down on the curb, and when he came to, he said, you can run the Boston Marathon. And then he said, women have hidden potential in endurance and stamina. And that's when I realized what he had been thinking all along is what I was feeling, which was, I can't go as fast as these guys, I can't lift weights, I can't be as strong as the guys, but I can run forever. And that is my secret weapon. And maybe it's the secret weapon that all women have. Who knows? It's certainly what I have. And the next day, Arnie was delivering mail all over campus. And he was saying to people, she ran me in the ground. You know, you know, she ran 31 miles. And, and I was feeling so great because I knew I got to go to the Boston Marathon. True to his word, Arnie came over to my dorm that afternoon. We weren't going to run that day. Um, it was the day after the workout with all the applications for the Boston Marathon. And he said, okay, this is a serious race. Now it was all business. This is a serious race. You've got to fill out the entry form. You've got to go to the school infirmary and take a physical. In those days, all the men had to have a physical exam before the race. He said, you have to have a, uh, to get the physical exam. They prefer a medical certificate, he said, because you don't want to be running around in the gym with all these guys who are naked getting their exams. Go to the, the school doctor, fill out the form, um, and I said, oh, Arnie, I said, do I have to enter the race? And he said, yes, this is very serious race. These guys at Boston are very, very strict. And I said, but what if it's against the rules someplace? And he said, ah, knew you were going to ask that. Got the AAU, Amateur Athletic Union, rule book right here. And we went through men's track and field, women's track and field, cross country. The longest distance for women's cross country was a mile and a half. Men's, I believe, at the, that time was, was uh, five miles or 10 Ks. Um, and then the last category in the rule book was the marathon, nothing about gender. And he said, oh, Arnie, I'd say maybe we're pressing a point. And he said, no, nothing about gender. He said, people just wouldn't believe a woman could run it. And why would they make a rule about it? And I said, well, you're right there. And so I looked through the entry form, nothing about gender in the entry form. So I filled out the entry form. I signed my name with my initials. I signed K.V. Switzer. And when I signed it that way, obviously, when the form went in, they couldn't tell it from a guy's. I didn't do it to defraud them. I signed my name K.V. Switzer because my dad misspelled my name on my birth certificate. I left out the E out of Catherine. My name was always misspelled. So at age 12, when I decided I wanted to become a journalist, and I loved J.D. Salinger and T.S. Eliot and E.E. E. Cummings, I thought K.V. Switzer was also cool. So K.V. Switzer it was, and it went in, and that was another thing that changed history because when the entry form arrived, at the Boston Athletic Association headquarters. They thought it was Kurt, Carrier, Kim, but not Catherine. Can you describe the scene the morning of the marathon? I mean, who was with you and what were you thinking? What was going through your mind that morning? 
I'm going to start with the scene the night before because we left after class, and so we didn't even arrive in Boston until about 10 o'clock at night. And it was just sleeting and raining and horrible, horrible weather. And we were all joking about how we were going to have to wear our heavy gray warm-up suits the next day because it was just really totally miserable. And the next morning, absolutely, it was coming down. Only the rain was great big snowflakes, the kind that come down and melt on you. So everybody was getting soaked. And indeed, I put on my heavy gray warm-up suit. And um, underneath, I had a really cute pair of shorts and a top on that I w really wanted to show off because I wanted to look good. And I decided, I have to keep warm here. It was about 33 degrees with a headwind. Um, and of course, you know, Boston runs est west to east, so it was a headwind the whole way. I thought, these are terrible, terrible conditions. In fact, I think they're the worst in Boston history. On the other hand, I'd been training in it for Syracuse. That's exactly what we had all the time in Syracuse. We drove to the start of the Boston Marathon at Hopkinton High School. Arnie parked in front of the school. The snow was coming down. He said, wait in the car. I'll get the team packet. We had entered as a team, the Syracuse Harriers. So they're all in one envelope together. So he went in and got the team packet and our numbers um, and, and came out. And we pinned them on in the car, waiting until the absolute last minute to get out and warm up and went and parked in the church parking lot. This, I have to tell this because, you know, nowadays you can't get within 20 miles of Boston with your car. So we parked in the church parking lot and was doing our warm-ups there. They had us all herded into a, a fenced-off area at the end of Hayden Row, right by the Hopkinton Common there. And uh, the officials were totally rattled because the weather was so bad. And they were covered with snow and had their hats and their overcoats on. And they, we, we pulled up our shirts to show our numbers. And they just pushed us in and checked off the numbers off a checklist. And so when they pushed me in, I looked at Arnie. And Arnie said, see, told you there'd be no problem. For me, it was like going to Mecca. You know, it was the moment I had waited for for many, many years to run this great race. And here I was doing it with my friends. And I knew I, I, knew I was really well trained I, not to go fast but I'd run 30 miles in bad weather in Syracuse and I could, I could face this. So I wasn't expecting anything but a good hard race and, and joy. So you didn't have anxieties at that time really? No, because all the guys were coming over to me in the, in the pen and saying, hey, that's great. Hey, and then and there, he said, that's my wife. Take, take, her, take my picture with my wife. And um, also, would you give me some tips for my wife or my girlfriend to run? You know, I'd really like her to start running. She would really enjoy it. And I'd say, sure, you know, put your shoes on and go. <laughs> then what happens? You know, shortly after this race starts, tell me, tell me what happens next. First, you roll down the street by, by the Hopkinton Common, and it was just such a great sensation of finally, when the race starts, the nervousness goes, the anxiety goes, because you know you just got 26 miles ahead of you. And as people came f flowing by us, because we were, we were going slowly, um, they would say, go for it, you know, we're with you all the way, you're going to have a great race, see ya. And then came this beeping, and the beeping was the press truck. Now, if you can imagine, Boston was so poorly organized in those days. They started the press truck behind the runners and then beeped at everybody and made them move over and went by. Then another beeping comes, and there is another bus that's alongside, and on, in this bus are the officials um, who are being dropped off, the timers and the officials, and the, the, um, the scribes, uh, journalist scribes, because they were inside writing. And apparently the guys on the bus were teasing him, saying, hey, Jock, there's a girl in your race, and she's wearing numbers. Wonder what her name is, Jock. And they looked me up and said, oh, is it Kurt or Carrie? Wonder what her mother thinks, Jock, you know? And he came up behind me, and at the last minute, I heard the scraping of leather shoes, just like you hear a dog's claws when you're running. And suddenly I turned, and he just, and then he started clawing at me, starting to try to rip my numbers off. And I jumped away and go, ah, ah, ah. And Arnie started screaming and batting him and saying, leave her alone, she's OK, I've trained her. Leave her alone, she's OK, I've trained her. And he said, you stay out of this, Arnie. And I thought, my god, these guys know each other. Well, I tried to get away, you know, fight or flight. And as I ran, he grabbed my shirt and pulled me back and kept trying to grab these numbers away like this. And Arnie said, run like hell. And <laughs> down the street we went. And I was wiping tears away by this time because I was so scared. And Tom was cursing, and Arnie was cursing, and saying, you jock should never have done that. So they got the pictures of this whole incident. And I was so humiliated and so ashamed and scared. I was really scared because um, I felt so unwelcome. I felt like, like a, 
an amateur girl, that I wasn't welcome, that I was, um, I was messing up a really important race. You know, Boston was like second to the Olympic Games, and I was messing it up somehow. And it didn't occur to me that, at first, that I deserved to be in that race. I was just humiliated. It was sort of like walking into a dinner party where you think you're invited and you're not. Um, and then a great thing happened. Suddenly, I really got angry. I really got angry. Like, I could have murdered him. I could have murdered him. And I just started getting angrier and angrier. And the press truck stayed with us and stayed with us. And then they got very aggressive. Where are you from? What are you trying to prove? And they hung there because they obviously thought I, I, I was there for a prank or some kind of publicity stunt. And I was so insulted at them. And then, I heard this, this grinding of a, another bus come by, and it was the same official's bus, and Jock had gotten up and gotten on the bus, and he was standing on the running board, you know, in the old days, and you hang on to the side on the running board, and he shook his finger at us and cursed again, and said in a wonderful Scots bro, you are all in big trouble. Well, you can imagine what all the guys <laughs> around me did and said to him, because they all kind of banded together and said, oh, it's terrible, all that kind of stuff. I just looked down. My mother always said, ignore people when they're really awful to you or aggressive, you know, ignore them, like put my head down. And, um, and Arnie screamed at him and, and said, you just get out of here, jock. And the bus just went off in a cloud of dust. And, and the press trucks hung with us for a long time. Did you think about quitting at all? Did that ever occur to you because this horrible thing had happened? It never occurred to me once to quit. I absolutely would not have quit. Um, two, two things. One, of course, you're worried in a marathon uh, that phys physiologically, and of course, this is the intrigue of the marathon. Anything can happen. You can get extremely fatigued. You can get diarrhea. You can get bitten by a dog. You can fall down. All these things can happen in the marathon, but I couldn't happen to me. And if they did, I was going to have to finish anyway. The second thing, and a little more sinister, was the fact that he was a very angry man. And he was going to have the last word. You, know, you can tell those kinds of people. I could tell when he went off on the bus. And um, I said to Arnie, I said, you know, we might get arrested. So we're going to go around a corner. He's going to have told the cops, pull her off the course. And um, he said, he, Arnie was saying, well, I'm not sure about that. But there were an awful lot of cops on the, co on the course that day. All of them were very, very nice to me. And um, it was, we finished without incident. But um, in, indeed, later, I read in the newspaper that he had told them to, and they, they said, no way, you know? So I went ahead and finished. So he, he really was a very angry guy. But no, an interesting thing happens when you're running 26 miles. And one of the best things is you can't run that long and stay mad. You, you know, you work out all your aggressions, you come to resolution, finally, and someplace over Heartbreak Hill, after I had murdered Jock Semple in every way you could murder him, and, and being angry at people, and especially other women, why aren't there other women here? And uh, then it began, I began to get angry and say, why is the longest event in the Olympic Games 800 meters? Why don't we have scholarships at Syracuse or any other place? Why isn't there prize money sports for women? Why aren't there other teams? You know, all of this sudden it began occurring to me, and then the light went on. It's not because women don't want those things. It's because they've never had an unintimidating experience and an opportunity to prove themselves. And so by the time they get to be 20, they've heard all the myths all their lives about getting big legs or growing hair on your chest, and they're, they're afraid to take part in something that's arduous. And having no experience to prove otherwise, of course, they're going to think that they're weak and feeble um, or that it's inappropriate. And I said, I'm going to create those opportunities. It was a wonderful epiphany. And I'd forgotten all my anger about Jock. He was just a product of his time. He was just ignorant. We can go forward from this. Other women don't understand. I'll create the opportunities for them. And by the time I finished the race, you know, I'd come out of that trough of exhaustion. I felt terrific. If it weren't for badly blistered feet, I felt like I could have run all the way back to Hopkinton because I kind of had a life plan. I'd finished my marathon. Um, I was going to create these opportunities. And the other thing I wanted to do was to become a better athlete. I knew I could run faster. I knew that I was going to be criticized for being a jogger because four hours and 20 minutes in those days was considered a jogging time. And I wanted to become a better athlete to prove that I could and also to prove to myself that I could. So I had all these goals laid out before me and I felt so happy. It was a total resolution.
women were finally made official in the Boston Marathon in 1972, the year before. And it was really important. We'd done a lot of legislation. We'd proved ourselves. And I think it was after that race that Jock realized how well we ran because we had to meet a men's qualifying standard of three hours, 30 minutes, which is tougher than it is even today. And um, we, we all did that. And I, in fact, got a trophy in the race. And, and Jock had to present me with this trophy. It was broken. It was broken in packing or something. And he handed me the trophy. And he said, well, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry you got a broken trophy. But he said, but I've been mad at you for five years, and you deserve a broken trophy. So that was how I, that was my award presentation for 72. But then in 73, there I am on the start line of the race, and all of a sudden somebody comes up and grabs him. It was Jock, and I went, because oh, I thought he was going to hit me. I thought he was mad at me or something. And he, he put his hand on my shoulder and turned me around and planted a big kiss on my cheek in front of all of the TV cameras and the press cameras and said, come on, lass. Let's get a wee bit of notoriety. And I often say that was Jock Semple's way of saying thank you, a man who'd ne never apologized ever in his life for, for this. Um, but some people don't say thank you, and that was his way. And it was interesting because the New York Times used that photograph uh, in the paper. Uh, I always felt kind of sorry for the winner. Um, but it, the caption said everything. It said the end of an era. And it was true. That was a sea change in women's sports, where if Jock Semple, of all people, could welcome women into the Boston Marathon with a kiss, that um, it, it really meant that women were accepted and that, that we were accepted on a level of the guys. And we'd fought hard for that, but it was a wonderful moment, and I was thrilled with it. Going back to the race, I mean, after you got through this trauma and the violence and the reporters and the quiet, then what happened on the race to you? There's an expression in running, you know, you can't run very long and stay mad, and certainly you cannot run 26 miles and stay mad. And so about 21 miles, I had murdered Jock Semple in every possible way there was to murder him. And, and then suddenly it occurred to me, you know, it's not his fault. He's a product of his time. He's a man of his time. He's ignorant about this. He doesn't know I'm serious. Um, and then, then I stopped being mad at other women because I was saying, why aren't other women in this race? And then I started to think, why is the longest event in the Olympic Games a, a mere 800 meters for women? Why aren't there women's scholarships at the universities? Why aren't there more intercollegiate sports? Why aren't there uh, paid professional opportunities in sports for women? And suddenly it be began to occur to me that it wasn't women's fault. It was the fault that we didn't have the opportunities to give them an unintimidating experience to, to try and to, to prove otherwise and, and to refute the myths. So, you know, if a little girl is told not to climb trees when she's 12 years old because, you know, she's going to turn into a guy and, and she's going to grow hair on her chest by the time she's 20, she's not going to run a marathon because she's going to be too afraid of a myth that's been, been given to her all these years. And, and worse, she's going to feel that it's inappropriate to try. And therefore, she's going to miss all the same in, empowerment and the experience that I've had. And the epiphany came then. You know, it was, it's not Jock's fault. It's not women's fault. It's opportunity. I'm going to try to create those opportunities. I also wanted at the same time to try to become a better athlete. I knew I was going to finish this race slowly, four hours and 20 minutes. It's not slow now. I mean, millions of people run four hours and 20 minutes. But at the time, it was considered jogging time. And I wanted to prove that I could be a better athlete, not only to, to prove on behalf of women that it could be done, but to prove to myself that I could get better. And by the time I finished the race, I was, I was very happy. I, I felt, in fact, light. I felt, except for the blisters on my feet, I could have run all the way back to Hopkinton. And I had a life plan, you know? I was going to create the opportunities, going to become a better athlete. And I knew what, I, you know, what the, whole, the whole focus was going to be. You know. It's amazing to think in a marathon that all these things can happen. But there is an expression in a marathon that you do go through sort of a lifetime of experience. You, you either live it in your head or you feel it in your bones. And I often say that I started the Boston Marathon as a girl and I finished the Boston Marathon as a grown woman. And it's true. Uh, that race changed my life. The reception that you got across that finish line? The reception at the finish line was left a lot to be desired. They were very crabby officials and very crabby journalists. Not many. It was so bitterly cold that everybody had given. There were very few spectators even out in the course when we were running. People had just given up. It was so miserable. And at the finish, there were only a couple of timers there who refused to acknowledge our time. There was one kind official who threw army blankets over us because it was so, we were so wet and freezing. Um, 
but the journalists were the best. They were so irritated, and it was clear that they'd gone back to the newsroom, and somebody said, you've got to go back out there and wait for the girl to finish. And they were miserable, and they asked very aggressive questions and, and were, were, were very pushy. And I gave as good as I got at that point. And I said, yes, I'm absolutely going to be back next year. You know, women can run. Women deserve to run. Uh, is this an equal rights issue? And I said, yeah, it's becoming an equal rights issue. So I was really, it, it amazed me that I had the presence of mind to say those things. There was only one journalist, and his name was Joe Kincannon from the Boston Globe, and he was my age, uh, young, 20. It was, must have been his first big assignment. And he actually asked me very kind, good, insightful questions. And Joe Kincannon and I became dear friends for a long time, and he was a great crusader on behalf of women. Did you run this race for you or to prove a point? Oh, I never ran Boston to, to prove a point. That was really interesting. I was very naive about the women's rights issues. I felt that other women somehow just didn't understand sports and, you know, it wasn't until I was in the race that I knew I wanted to change that for women. But, um, no, Boston, the Boston Marathon in 1967 was my reward for showing Arnie Briggs in practice that I could do the distance. And so we went in as just sort of kids doing, doing the race. Once Jock Semple attacked me in the race, however, uh, the, the whole issue changed. Tell me about the amateur athletic union's reaction and sort of how that played out initially and then over the years, what you've had to do. You know, I was back at my, uh, on campus for about uh, 24 hours and I got a special delivery letter from the amateur athletic union in, uh, I believe it was based in Washington at the time, but uh, anyway, and it, it expelled me from the Amateur Athletic Union, which was like, if you're a Catholic, it's like being excommunicated from the church. Serious, very serious. I was so mad at that point because I felt we had done all the things right. We had filled out the entry form. We paid our entry fee. I was a card-carrying member of the AAU. I took my physical. I'd done the, the distance and practice. I'd done everything right according to the rules. And now they said it was because I had run more than a mile and a half I had fraudulently entered the race. I had run with men, which was the worst, because there's a sexual implication to that. I'd run with men. But the best thing was I had run the Boston Marathon without a chaperone. And, and the, we all looked at each other and said, what kind of rules are these that, you know, it was just amazing. So I was expelled for those four reasons, and the guys also were expelled. Um, Arnie never renewed his membership, and he never spoke to Jock Semple again. Um, I decided that I was going to have to work with, within the establishment if I was going to make change. And um, that also changed my life because I had to then learn a lot about the system. And um, a year or so later, I had a hearing where I got back into the AAU. And I began organizing races because I knew that was the way to create the opportunities. Ultimately, you did get the ban lifted. Yeah, I got the ban lifted about 18 months later. But there were fun, fun moments also with that because right after the uh, expulsion letter came an invitation to run a marathon up in Canada. And I felt like a Vietnam dra d draft dodger going up there to run these races. But it was so great to be welcome into a competition. You won your first marathon in 74. Can you tell me about that, what that was like for you? You know, I ran and won many marathons or, or was the first woman because I was often the only woman in the race. And after this time at Boston, I got a lot of invitations because uh, the race director knew that he was going to get a lot of publicity if there was a girl in his race. And, and I must tell you, this is very important, the guys in running and, and the guy, race directors, for the most part, were really welcoming to me, really, really helpful. It was just a few really crummy officials who, who were very narrow-minded and the rules it, it, it were set up to, to be narrow-minded. The guys themselves were wonderful. So um, when I won the New York City Marathon, though, in 1974. That was a big deal race. By that time, women had been official in running for two years, and I really uh, wanted a big title. And when I, when I won it, I was disappointed in the fact that I hadn't broken three hours because I trained to break three hours in the marathon. Three hours in the marathon in those days separated the men from the boys or the girls from the women, who had, whatever way you wanted to put it. And I really wanted to be in that league. But it turned out to be uh, four laps of Central Park on a very, very hot day. It started at 100 degrees, humidity, breaking thunderstorms. The irony of this thing is that I did win the New York City Marathon in 1974 by the biggest margin of victory in the history of the New York City Marathon, 27 minutes. That's never going to be eclipsed. 
But the following year at Boston, with perfect weather conditions, when I thought I was going to win the Boston Marathon and go well under three hours, I was beaten by a woman from Germany who set a world record. I did indeed run a personal best of two hours, 51 minutes, um, which would have won the Boston Marathon for women in every previous year. But she set a world record in the biggest margin of victory in the history of the Boston Marathon. So we, we, you know, I got it on both sides. It was really fun. Tell me about the Olympics. Why was it so important to you, and, and what did you have to do to get women's marathon into the Olympics? You know, the Olympic Games is what we have as the highest level of sport. Everybody in the world understands the Olympic Games. And when the marathon for women got into the Olympic Games in 1981 for the 1984 Games, then women themselves would realize, oh, I can be a marathon runner because it's in the games. You see, it's then accepted and acknowledged that women can achieve at the highest level in the most arduous event that is in the Olympic program. So it was a phenomenal moment. And I said when we got that vote finally from the, the um, International Olympic Committee in 1981, I said, nobody's going to understand how important this is until the first woman comes through that Olympic tunnel into the stadium. And indeed, you know, that's when. You know, I said uh, 90,000 people are going to get it in the stadium. But it was more than that. It's when 2.2 billion people globally are watching it on television, are understanding that these are women running 26.2 miles or 42.2 kilometers, and every country in the world understands how long that is. That they've ridden a donkey or they've ridden a bicycle over the distance, and they know it's a long race. And here are women doing it. And that, more than anything, is going to change people's notions about women's sense of limitation. And I believe it has. To me, in fact, getting the women's marathon in the Olympic Games was important in a way as giving the women the right to vote. It's the physical equivalent of the right to vote because it's acknowledgment at the highest level that women can achieve anything physically. How did you feel watching that race? At the time of the 1984 Games, I was working as a commentator. It was, it was really one of my first big television broadcasts for the marathon to cover the first women's Olympic marathon. And I was a bit torn because Joan Benoit Samuelson now uh, took a wild lead in the race. Uh, and it was either the greatest gamble in the world or one of the most foolhardy things to do. But she held it and she came into the stadium. And so when I saw her coming into the stadium, you know, take a deep breath and try not to be emotional um, because um, it was a very, very emotional moment for me. But I had to be a journalist. So I had to be as strong as I could and just you know, tell the story. But afterwards, it was a tremendous sense of, of relief. I was terribly worried, of course, and, and we had an argument even on the air about this, about Gabriel Anderson Chase, who came into the stadium from Switzerland, and she was in a dehydrated condition. And I felt that the television was playing this for all its dramatic, melodramatic worth um, when I knew she was dehydrated. And it, it wasn't a death-defying situation and we were dragging it out. Um, and I was afraid that it would set women's running back, just like 1928. I thought, oh my gosh, what if they pull the marathon after this, thinking that this is a dangerous thing for women? In fact, fortunately, you know, Gabriel was made a heroine um, for, for triumphing over the distance and, and finishing in a, you know, a tough way. And she was fine the next day. What were the objections and what arguments did you use to counter them? The biggest objections to getting women's marathon in the Olympic Games was that women shouldn't be running with men because in the Olympics you have separate events. And so far in the marathon we've been running with men, so we needed to prove that we could do it on our own. That's why I set up a women's only running circuit of races globally. But the second thing, of course, was the old medical chestnut about women turning into men or losing their reproductive capability or becoming less of women because they were doing something arduous, that it was too difficult, that we would damage women. So we had to refute that. We had oh, wonderful doctors uh, working with us and giving great evidence, like Dr. David Martin in Atlanta, Georgia, who was doing these studies to prove that we did have the endurance capability. Throughout your life, it seems it's so important for you to be physically active and also feminine. A lot of people, I think, still conceive those traits as somewhat exclusive. Do you still see that? Yes, it's interesting that many people still imagine that if a woman is an athlete, she's got to be somehow masculine, not feminine. Certainly that exists in a lot of countries. I'll never forget when I was organizing races in Brazil, the head of the Athletic Federation there said, our women aren't going to run your race. 
um, you know, women here are feminine. I said, well, there's nothing unfeminine about running. He said, oh, well, he said, my wife will not come with me to the race and I won't permit my daughter to run. That was the level of fear. This was 1979 and 1980. He said, your race isn't gonna be successful. You'll probably have 150 women. We had 10,000 women. And you know, you can't ignore 10,000 women in shorts running through the streets of Rio. And the women themselves, of course, found it joyful and wonderful. They just wanted the opportunity. Well, fortunately for me, he got on my side and we got a vote for, for the Olympic inclusion. But yes, there are many, many countries that still equate the strength of a woman runner uh, with somehow being masculine and therefore being inappropriate. We, we have major problems in the Olympic movement with many countries, you know, you know, don't let the women go out on the street alone. You have to have their faces covered. You're a completely different social and culture situation. So how those women are going to ever have an Olympic opportunity is going to be very, very difficult, and it's something that we have to realize. Yeah. In some of the races I've organized, um, in Kuala Lumpur, for instance, it was uh, interesting, the society, a third of the society is, is, um, is Muslim, and the women ran covered. And it was really fantastic to see thousands of these women with, they had their arms covered and they had headcloths and long pants, but they were out there running. A girlfriend of mine runs, organizes a race in Marrakesh, and to see these women running in burqa is fantastic. 5,000 women and many of them fully covered. But they're out there running because this is an opportunity in a women's only environment where they still can express themselves. They're lucky. There are many, many women who can't even go out the door. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of self impose limitations, what they are and where do they come from and what do you do about them? You know, I think we all have self-imposed limitations. It's because, you know, you can't imagine something until you can feel something. That's why I think that the women's sports movement and women's running in particular is nothing short of a social revolution because you feel the sense of power and accomplishment and you, you know that that's going to translate into other parts of your lives. So for me, the key thing was to create an opportunity where women could begin at a very beginning level and then imagine the next step and the next step and then even imagine the marathon. When I organized my Avon series of races, eventually 400 races in 27 countries, and it was really phenomenal, we would start with an 11 or 12 week series of clinics, how to run clinics. Here's how to get a pair of shoes, here's how to put on shorts, here's how to run, here's how to, you know, what you do. And so that they could get through, let's say, a 5K, a 3.1 mile race. And then if you can do that, you can imagine that you can do 10Ks and et cetera, et cetera. Many of those women became Olympic athletes. It's one of my greatest sources of pride to see that somebody who didn't imagine they could do anything could become an Olympic champion. Often it's very hard for a person themselves to realize they can do something. But one of the greatest things about this mass movement of running is that it's very, very public. And so let's say the New York City Marathon, for instance, or the London Marathon, Millions of people go out in the street and watch. And you will see every age, every size, every level of ability going by. You know, you know, handicap people as well. And you say, boy, if they can do that, I can do that. And, and then they maybe go out privately and go around the block a couple of times and they realize, well, maybe I can do more than that. Or they join a local running club. That's really, really important, yes, to overcome your own sense of, uh, of limitation. One of the best things to do, I often say to women, is to get with a group and, and get your buddies and your girlfriends together or your neighbors and just go out in the morning or evening and, and walk, jog, run together. Um, and suddenly you realize you're doing a few miles and then you can, you can go from there. It's, it's just letting your mind expand. And I, I think it's, um, it's so dramatic with running because in a way it's, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's very, very simple. Can you talk a little bit about the status of women's professional sports now? When you look at professional sports for women, what do you think about the opportunities and, and how people view it? I think one of the most amazing things is we have parity at last in the Olympic Games. There are as many women's running events as there are men's running events now. And that says a lot. Of course, in the Olympic Games, our, our big challenge now is to have countries uh, with women, all women being represented in, from every country. So that's a, that's a very big challenge. In professional sports, other professional sports, again, I, I have been slightly disappointed. I would really love to see more professional women's basketball, more professional uh, baseball, perhaps, or softball, um, uh, hockey. I don't understand why different cities don't find it really interesting to have women's teams. You know, I spend a lot of time uh, in my life in New Zealand. Um, 
my husband's a New Zealander, and I'm a New Zealander now also, as well as an American, and I live half the time there. And when women play sports there, they join clubs also, and they have, after work, field hockey or uh, basketball or netball or, or whatever they're playing, and they, they are very, very feisty and, and very, very competitive. And I don't see communities with women's teams, um, even pickup teams, and I'd like to see that happen. Why do you think that is? I mean, people don't seem to want to go see professional sports played by women as much as they do played by men. Why? I think it begins at the grassroots. I think that uh, once people are through with high school or, or college, that they think that they have to put the toys away and, and, and they don't go out and create their own community field hockey team, let's say. I think, I can't understand why every community doesn't have a, a group of women who are playing field hockey as they did in high school or college. Um, and then the professionalism comes from there with an, with an upward mobility or farm teams and then onto professionals, things. Um, again, I'd like to see women themselves take charge of that, but um, it hasn't happened in the way I would imagine it would. You know, you witnessed as a young woman incredible anger on the part of men over what you were doing to assert your right to be an athlete, didn't want you to compete. Does this kind of anger still exist? Do you ever see it now? The anger that existed in running was really only from officials. I was extremely lucky in that the, the people I trained with, which were really guys because other women weren't running then, were wonderful, nothing but totally supportive. So my bias is completely different. I didn't experience that anger at all. The only hostility I experienced was from officials or odd people, spectators maybe, or people alongside of the road. Has that anger gone away, that kind of, you know, official, you're breaking the rules or women shouldn't, has that gone away? Because of the Jock Semple incident, everybody thinks that I experienced tremendous amount of anger in running. The, the opposite is the case because the guys I ran with, uh, coaches and, and most race directors were nothing but welcoming and motivational and encouraging. I was extremely lucky. Um, I know that. And does the anger still exist? Not in running. I don't, I don't see any animosity whatsoever in the sport. Maybe in a different culture. Okay? I couldn't speak for the Mideast, for instance. So uh, clearly, you know, uh, we, we live in a privileged culture in, in uh, North America. But um, other sports I know have had tremendous problems. I was appalled to see, you know, what was happening in, in ski jumping, for instance, just recently, which finally has been admitted to the Olympic Games. There was some real hostility there. I was getting calls from the women themselves who were ski jumpers wanting to get the event in the Olympic Games, and the, it was the same old chestnut about women's fragility and, and displacing the uterus from, from ski jumping, when it was just ridiculous to, to throw that out after all these years, when the marathon, you'd think, would have disproved all these things. So it, it was sad to see, um, obvi obviously, anger passed on in this way. What was your very first paying job? My very first paying job was my second choice. I really wanted to be a journalist, but by that time I was married and I was putting my husband through graduate school. So I had to take a job in public relations. <gasps> oh my gosh, I thought I'd prostituted myself. And I went to work for Bristol Laboratories Division of Bristol Myers in public relations. And within about two weeks, I loved my job. And I loved what public relations could do. And went back uh, to university at night to Syracuse and got my master's degree in public relations. And it was one of the best things I ever did. How important was it for you to, to earn money as a woman? You know, you know, if you read my book, you'll read that money was always a really big issue for me because it seemed that I never had a lot of money. And it was hard for me, you know, my parents to put me through school. And I had to get part-time jobs. And I also then got married. And I was putting my husband through graduate school. And he was trying to be, make the Olympic team. And so he was having expensive equipment. And I was running in, with holes in my running shoes. Um, and on and on that seemed to go. And I was determined um, to someday make some pretty good money. And that was one reason why I went back to school at night to get my, get my master's degree, because I knew that I wasn't going to be taken too seriously um, when I had to compete for a job against a guy, for instance, um, unless I had more credentials in my back pocket than that other person did. So that's why it became important to me. Fortunately, you know, I did succeed. And um, I'm, I'm certainly not a wealthy person, but I'm OK. What about success? How important is was success to you? Success was really important to me because um, it was a way of showing that I was right about women's running. And, you know, there were so many naysayers about women's running and so many people who didn't believe women could or should run. Um, by being both successful in a career, 
um, and with a program that disproved all those myths, um, that was important to me. I organized eventually with Avon Cosmetics a series of 400 races uh, in 27 countries for over a million women. Um, and that was a huge success because those races were often the very first time a country had ever put on a women's race. So it was a matter of going from country to country to country, teaching them everything about course measurement and traffic control and how to put up toilets and grandstands and finish line banners and tents um, to scoring and timing and, and getting the women themselves on the side. It was a huge job, but incredibly fulfilling. And the fact that I got paid for it, it was just very, very exciting to me. How could I get paid for doing my dream? It was really amazing. I like telling that story to people because, you know, if you know that there's something deficient or wrong in society and you go out to change it and make it better, it often can become a job. And sometimes um, that job is going to be very fulfilling. I wonder what you think about women's attitudes toward power, ambition. I have always been ambitious. Um, People always laugh at my, my own running ability because, you know, basically on paper I don't have talent. But I'm willing to do the miles and really to do the hard work. I was also always willing to be the person who stayed late in the office. In fact, all night sometimes to get the job done. Um, and it, it paid off. Um, I had tremendous stamina and endurance to do that, but it was, I was ambitious. I really wanted to be successful. What about women along the way? Both as a runner, but also I'm thinking professionally. Have women been very supportive, if you've seen them as allies or otherwise? It's interesting in business about how women perceive other women. And um, when I first started in business, there were not a lot of executive women. I was often always the first who got a salary rather than punching a time card. I was always the, f I was the youngest manager or I was the youngest director, et cetera. Then, and there were two factors working here. One, I wasn't afraid of the male environment because I had trained and worked with men. So I felt unintimidated in business meetings and, 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 and in confrontational situations. The other thing is there weren't a lot of other women who were there to be role models for me. But the ones who were there, I, I think I was pretty fortunate. I didn't get any queen bee syndrome, I worked up the hard way and therefore you are too. Um, they were pretty, pretty welcoming. I must say my biggest corporate job was at Avon Cosmetics, which is a women's company. Um, most of the executives now, in fact, across the board are women. And um, they are really sharp, put together, and um, it was a great environment to go up the ladder in. I'm wondering about your expectations about marriage relationships. Were you brought up that marriage was a given, and then how did that work out? You know, the personal stuff was always hard. I, I've got to say, I wrote about this. I said I could face any business or athletic situation, but the domestic stuff at home, cleaning a bathtub in New York City was always the thing that drove me to tears. I mean, because I could never keep up with that. Um, but, and, and that's what made me understand how difficult it is to balance the domestic stuff and the family as well uh, as a career. I never had kids by choice. Part of the reason was is I married the wrong guys until I got 40, and by then I just really wanted to enjoy this wonderful man, Roger Robinson. But if I had married Roger when I was 24, I wonder, you know, if we would have had a family, we probably would have. If I would have been as successful as I became. I doubt it. I don't think you can stay in your office overnight. And I don't think you can go on six weeks trips to, to China, Japan, and Malaysia to break down athletic barriers for women and to create events when you've got little kids at home. Um, I think it's very, very hard and women who have, who have made that balance uh, have my greatest, greatest respect. Do I regret not having children is of course the question everybody asks me. No, quite frankly, but I'm lucky because every time I see a woman out running I say she's one of mine. So I've got a couple million women out there who are, are my own children I feel. Talk a little bit about the, the sort of expectations about what gives in these family pressures. You know, in terms of family pressures, you know, I, I'll never forget the only, one of the few times I was really kind of bitter was I was home late in the afternoon on a commuter train and I got off the commuter train with all these men and the men were met by their women, their wives in the cars and the women got out of the cars and they were in their tennis outfits and things and I'm saying, well, no wonder they're successful. They've got somebody running the show at home who's, you know, handling all of that and probably doing the bills and, and paperwork as well as running the house and managing. Boy, I'd really like a wife too. 
you know, that would be terrific. And then I thought, boy, you know, this is, is such a hard balance. Um, I don't know how women can do it. It was a sad thing. I think I was maybe one of the last generations, and maybe it exists now, but not as bad, um, that, that women were expected to give up their careers for the family. Um, to the point where certainly I remember once in, in one job, uh, I'll never forget my boss telling me, he said, you know, he said, if I'd hired a guy for your job, I would have had to pay him twice the salary. I mean, you know, I could have sued him for that, and I didn't even realize it. I took it as a really left-handed compliment. But it's just absolutely amazing. But now what is wonderful is people are seeing the value of women's work and the value of women's um, uh, contribution to the family as well in different ways, and it's shared often. I see it in running a lot. I see where, uh, in a couple, where they have, a, uh, let's say, uh, several children, the guy will do his run at a certain time, she watches the kids, and then he will watch the kids so she can do her run, and they balance their lives like that, and I find it very, very healthy. Often, the guy said, well, it's my year to do the Boston Marathon, but she gets to run the New York City Marathon. So they trade off. It didn't used to be that way. Yeah, you, you didn't get to trade off with your first husband that much. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Was that hard for you? I mean, after you'd, you'd entered the Boston Marathon, done all of that, and then the next year? I could tell you so many stories about my first marriage that would make you laugh and make you cry. But well, I think one of the hardest things is, is that I, too, kind of believed that somehow his career and his Olympics was going to be more important than my career. Because I was always told, well, you're just a jogger. You know, you can run a marathon, but you're still not really very good. But what happened is, is that I would get up at 5 in the morning and go run because then I had to go to work to support us. Uh, and then I would run again in the afternoons when I got home. And then I would go to night to graduate school. Now, how I kept up this pace is really quite amazing. But the astonishing thing is, is when you run hard and train hard, you get better. And I got really better. And I got a lot better as a runner than he ever got as a hammer thrower. So unfortunately, what happens in that kind of relationship then is the other person becomes very jealous. Instead of supporting you and say, hey, you know, you're becoming a really great runner. You know, let's work out this together. Just became very, very jealous of, you know, your basic no talent and I'm the talent and feeling that the world deserved, owed him a living. Um, and it was really sad that that relationship ended, um, but it was bound to happen. What did you think of the women's movement? Early on in my life, I did believe, certainly in the women's movement, I believe that women should be entitled to every opportunity that men had, that, that they certainly should get paid for equal work. I didn't understand why it was necessary to barge into what I felt barging into men's places, men's only clubs, for instance. Like, who would want to sit at McSorley's bar anyway? And, and <laughs> it's a smoky old place. You know, pay, give me some childcare here. You know, that's, that's really what I felt, thought the issue was, so that we could succeed in our careers. I thought that was really critically, critically important. But one thing that very much upset me is that after my first Boston Marathon in 1967, there were members of the women's uh, lib movement who tried to appropriate my running the Boston Marathon as a, a gesture for uh, the women's lib movement. And um, it, that wasn't the situation at that point for me. I wasn't trying to prove when I ran the race that I deserved to run the race. I just assumed I deserved to run the race. And it was only afterwards that I realized that it was a big issue. But it, it wasn't something they had done, and I felt that they shouldn't appropriate that, that they should go out and run and ex understand what other issues we were fighting for in, in the sports movement. I mean, what do you mean by that, and what were they doing that annoyed you? The, one of the things that most annoyed me is, is that please come to our women's lib movement because all men are horrible and prevent us from doing things. And I said, no, no, that's not true. In running, the men were the people who helped me the most. My coach was a guy. And they said, oh, no, all men are like Jock Semple, and they don't want us to run, and they're they, they putting up roadblocks, and they're preventing us in all areas of society. And I said, no, I don't think that's true. I think you need to go out and do it and get involved with them and to show them and, and to show that, that we can do these things. So I, I really objected to that kind of appropriation. It wasn't until much later when I realized that these women couldn't understand until they had the opportunity that they, they were going to change. And that's why I kept saying, please, let's create these sports opportunities, because if you can feel the power uh, from the opportunity, then change will happen. Do you think of yourself as a feminist? I think of myself as an ardent feminist. But you know, the be definition of a feminist is only somebody who believes in equality. I used to say, I'm not a feminist, I'm a humanist. Well, sorry. A feminist is a humanist.
When did you when did you make that switch? I think I made that switch when I was about 28. And I realized that the definition of a feminist is, is somebody who just believes in equality. And there are plenty of men who are feminists, too. Why do you think so many women, younger women, consider the word feminist a kind of dirty word? I think the younger generation doesn't understand. I mean, they better go to a dictionary. And um, I think that they are worried about, you know, some kind of movement, maybe, that's quite radical and bra-burning. Uh, when in fact it's only about equality, it's only about opportunity, it is only about humanistic. I, I just, in sport, I just keep coming back to it because to me, when you look at the future of sport, we're going to be doing things as men and women together, not just going out and running and jogging together, but events that are team events together. This is going to be the future of sport, where men with their power and strength and speed are going to combine with women's flexibility, endurance, and stamina and create a team that goes the distance on many, many. I, we can't even imagine what the event is right now. But I'm throwing this out to the public to say, you guys, this next generation, you think of it. Nobody believed that women could run a marathon, and we did that. So let's think of the next thing. There are many events, for instance, that are like uh, six-day events or endurance events or echo challenge events. And the guys will even admit that it is the women who are bringing the team home. The guys are pushing from the front, but it's the women who are bringing the team home, not just because they have more endurance capability, but perhaps because of our inborn capability of being mothers, that we have the ability to cope with stress while we are fatigued. And we're finding that we're in an orienteering when you're totally exhausted after three days of running and can't read the map anymore. The women can still be calm and, and can, can figure it out. Well, you know, if you've got six or seven babies at home screaming their heads off and you haven't slept for three days and you can still cope, that maybe that comes into play. Do you think that younger women understand the way it used to be for you and other women? You know, I'm not sure that younger women understand the way it used to be for me, but um, they find it fascinating. And I find that really very, very wonderful. Um, my mother never expected me to understand the way it was for her. You don't as a mother or, the, or a pioneer. You just want people to follow and go on to the next level. So when I find that young women are fascinated by it, I'm thrilled because I know that they're going to just kind of pick up the baton and go to the next step. Did you look back and think of the women upon whose shoulders you were walking in any way, or did you see yourself as kind of an original? I think I'm a little embarrassed to say that I didn't think of a lot of other women who broke barriers. I mean, I certainly knew about Susan B. Anthony. I knew about Gertrude Ederly. But I didn't think of me standing on their shoulders as much as I really did. I had no idea that the fight for women in the vote took as long as it did and that it was as terrible a fight uh, as it was. And so I'm ashamed of that. But uh, fortunately, you come to that knowledge later in your life. And it's really interesting now, uh, let's say in television, if I'm interviewing a young woman runner, I understand exactly her whole life, what she's, she's doing, but she doesn't know I've already been through that. And so she's explaining things to me in a very simplistic way. And I say, yes, I, I, I do understand that. The women's movement has been criticized sometimes as being a kind of focused on issues that really only matter to educated, middle-class, white women. Do you think this is a fair critique? I don't, actually, but I think that probably the women who have the courage and the education to lead the drive certainly are talking to their peer group. I mean, we have, let's just say, the, the Mideast or, or in Africa, you know, we had a tremendous, tremendous need to go there, but um, how can we reach them if there aren't people there who are spreading the word? Fortunately, again, I come back to running. You know, in Africa, the Kenyan women, some of them are just incredibly third-class citizens. It's just terrible to see women traded, you know, when they're young as a wife for cattle and that kind of stuff. And yet I see such hope with the women runners who are coming out of Kenya. They win prize money and they go back to their villages and they're building schools and inoculating kids and sanitizing water. They are changing the social fabric of those countries and their villages. And they are now taking an active role in politics. That's when the change is going to be happening. So we can only do as much as we can do. But um, yes, um, it's, it's happening. And I don't, I don't find that a criticism. Did you ever read The Feminine Mystique? I remember Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique so very well because it was right at the top of my consciousness when I first showed up on the golf course with the men's cross-country team at Syracuse University. I was going to say, 
this is the eve of the women's liberation movement, you know, and, and these guys are going to think, you know, I'm, I'm a, a crusader or something. But yeah, certainly I remember that book. And interestingly enough, all these years later, I'm reading it again. It really holds up, too. Did uh, the Miss America protests, any of those things, do you remember that? Yes, but you know, I, I got to tell you, I really thought the whole Miss America pageant was awfully silly too. And um, uh, I wasn't willing to protest it because I thought a woman should be able to be in the Miss America pageant if she wanted to be in the Miss America pageant. But one of the, the things I loved was when they finally started at least getting uh, scholarships and educational opportunities. Um, and I just felt that, that women could do anything. They didn't have to not do something because it was you know, pandering to the male establishment is, is the way that that was portrayed. There was a part of the women's liberation movement that did upset me a lot that was, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So for instance, in my case, here's another running thing. I ran in little tennis dresses because shorts were not designed for even men in those days or women to run in, and they really badly chafed your legs. So I realized that I was very, ran very well in my hockey tunic. I could run in a little tennis dress, and I looked pretty good as well. So I took an unmitigated amount of grief for this because I was looking too girly girl, and I was pandering to the male establishment, and I thought, I am just trying to prevent my legs from chafing. Now here we are, 45 years later, and the running skirt is all the rage. And I think it is so great that we can do anything we want to do. But to run in a pink running skirt in 1971, oh, forget it. Would people say things directly to you? Or? Absolutely. What are you trying to prove? You know, are you trying to, you know, what are you trying to pick up guys or something? Oh, just ridiculous. You know, I just, you know, blew them off. But it was, it was very annoying and hurtful. And I said, no, I'm just trying to keep my legs from chafing, that's all. Do you remember Roe v. Wade? Who could have ever forgotten Roe v. Wade? I mean, we, we were so pro-choice um, in, in those days, and we had you know, many experiences among our friends hearing terrible stories about you know, botched abortions. And it, you know, to me, it was a total non-issue that women didn't have choice. I, I couldn't believe it. And so when we, we got the Roe v. Wade um, decision, that was wonderful. I think what concerns me now is, is young women today maybe don't understand how important it is, um, and um, therefore, you're always in danger of losing something if you don't defend it. What about politics? Geraldine Ferraro, Hillary Clinton, do you have memories of female politicians? Is this something on your radar means anything to you? Yes, of course. I mean, I remember Geraldine Ferraro's political move, and of course, you know, Hillary Clinton, and I really feel uh, very badly for them because the, the, the country just wasn't ready for them. and. It, and it was a great loss. I remember voting for Bill Clinton because I thought I was getting a two-for-one special because he's a very bright man with an incredibly bright wife. And it seems to me that you don't go to bed at night and not talk about how the day went and ask for each other's advice. And um, I thought, you know, if you have somebody that that's bright, that bright behind you, uh, it's going to be good for the country. Um, so, yeah, uh, I find right now it's still going to be a long haul. Um, just as it's being a very difficult haul for President Obama right now, because the country just has to adjust to the fact that um, we need sensitive, intelligent people um, who can make correct decisions um, and not be biased by other thoughts. We now have had three female secretaries of state. We've had a major female candidate for president. A woman has just been named the head of the Democratic Party, but you also look at Fortune 500 companies. I'm looking at the statistics here. Women occupy 15% of the board seats. They're 3% of the CEOs. There's still a 23 percentage point earnings gap between men and women. And a lot of women go to graduate school and then they drop out. I mean, what's going on here, do you think? We have these two tracks happening, you know, that there are more opportunities than ever. And we, I think, have men who are more accepting of women than ever. But I think often it's really hard um, to live up to all of the expectations that you have. And I think that sometimes people get tired. And I think that also we still have the same reality of being at home and my life is going past and when am I going to have kids? And th th I think kids deserve everything you can give them. And so you don't want to be anything less for them and that maybe you can catch up later. I think that maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But um, I am incredibly disappointed 
that there's still a wage gap. I find that one of the most shocking. I don't find it shocking that there are less women in corporate uh, or chairmen of uh, uh, or chairpersons rather of w Fortune 500 companies because that does require sort of a 24/7 kind of job and maybe they're just not willing to do that. I think they know they can though. I think that's the difference is I, that that the opportunity is there if they're willing to sacrifice and go for it. So. Title IX. You know, I remember when Title IX was passed because it was an amazing year, 1972. 1972, women were official in the Boston Marathon in April. In early June, we had the, organized here in Central Park the first ever women's only road race called the Crazy Legs Mini Marathon, women only. Then Title IX was passed, the Equality of Education Amendment. We didn't understand, many of us, me in particular, that that would have a huge impact in sports. I thought it was absolutely essential because it was equality of education in any, every federally uh, funded institution. So that, well, that seems absolutely right to me. By the 1984 Olympics, it was profound, the change it had made and, and changing the attitudes in our schools. It's still not perfect. There's still controversy about it. But I'll tell you, it has changed this country phenomenally. And it's been absolutely fantastic. Can women use their sexuality as empowerment? You know, it is interesting that women can use their sexuality for empowerment. A lot of women, we couldn't say this before, I think in the women's liberation, uh, radical times in the late 60s, early 70s, because it was not the thing to say. But sex is, is powerful. Sex does make you feel strong. You know, it, 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 plenty of women have used sex for centuries um, as, as a powerful tool. Um, we feel sexy. When we run, we feel sexy. You feel your body. You move. You love what you can do. Um, and I think that, that sexiness isn't like just sexual. It's also sensuous. It's body awareness. I love the fact that Madonna's out there strutting her stuff. I love the fact that young girls can go out and run in a skirt now and a bra top. I think it's, it's fantastic that they are enjoying their bodies and they don't have a sense of um, restriction, and I think it's very important. Do you think it's gone too far when you look at very young girls trying to dress in a sexy way? If I were a parent, of course I would be very concerned about that because I would be very concerned about the images that young girls get about, um, is this the only way to be? That's what makes parenting even more important in, in showing alternatives and showing, you know, accomplishment and strength and confidence are, the, are key, not just sexiness. But sex has been around forever, and it's going to be there. And I think that, you know, yes, I think you, you have to be careful of your, your children that way. But um, little girls are always going to want to gravitate to to lipstick and, and makeup and dolls. You know, you can take a, a, a boy and a girl and raise them exactly the same, and they're, they're going to be that way. But the important thing is to give girls the opportunity and to be able to make the choice. What's your advice to young girls? I think my advice to young girls is to realize that they have every opportunity in the world if they'll go after it, and that, that restrictions are often only opportunities for them and that opportunities can even become a job, and that, um, that they need to believe in, in themselves by proving to themselves that they can do something. That's why, to me, sport running in particular is very, very important because they get a, a sense of getting back what they put into something. The more you put into running, let's say, the more you're going to get back, and the bigger the sense of accomplishment. But I think it is really critical for young girls to go out and try and to not put up artificial barriers in front of themselves. How do you feel when you're identified as the first woman to officially run in the Boston Marathon? How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, I'm very proud of being the first woman to officially run the Boston Marathon, but I really don't want to just be identified as that barrier breaker because the incident that happened to me happened to me. I didn't create the incident. What I really would rather be remembered for is somebody who created opportunities for millions of women to go, go beyond their self-imposed sense of limitation um, and to even get, help get the women's marathon into the Olympic Games. That is what I'd like to be remembered for. But yes, in terms of helping anybody along the route, I 
am very pleased with that. That's a wonderful legacy. It is a nice legacy. As I say, you know, not having children of my own to go out and see a woman running and to feel like that's one of my daughters is an extraordinary feeling. But I think even more is to receive a letter from somebody who never believed they could do something. Um, to say I started running and I just put one foot in front of the other. And I've lost 200 pounds and I ran the Boston Marathon and I know I can do anything. That to me is really overwhelming and makes me feel better than anything.